And uh, you'll find it helpful to take out your outlines as uh, we begin this new series. And this new series of messages, which we've called Crossroads, where what we're going to be doing over the next sort of uh, six, seven weeks is that we're going to be looking at what Jesus said from the cross and also what Jesus was doing on the cross. What did he say? What were some of the things that Jesus was saying at the cross, on the cross, and what did he achieve? What was he about when he was dying upon the cross? What was happening? And we begin this morning with dealing with an issue that we all face, something that we all struggle with, and that's dealing with the issue of guilt in all of our lives. God did not create you to live with guilt. In fact, God didn't even design your body to handle guilt. He designed it and intends for you to live guilt-free. Guilt, you see, really messes up your body. It messes up your mind and it messes up your relationships. Now the truth is, God wants you to live guilt-free. And if you wanted to get rid of the guilt in your life, then you have picked a good Sunday to come to church. Because you are not created to live with guilt. There is no reason for you to leave here today carrying any load of guilt in your life. God says, you've got to let it go. You've got to, you've got to dump it. You've... You've got to get rid of it. And maybe, maybe you are stuck in the past and you just don't know how to let go of some of those past things. You have regrets. You you may have secret shame and you have guilt. And God doesn't intend for you to carry that. And so as we lead up to Easter, we're going to look at the Easter story and we're going to look at how the death of Jesus Christ brings new life. And the first word that Jesus said from the cross is the word of forgiveness. And we pick up the story in Luke 23. The background here is that Jesus has been arrested. He's been up all night because they took him through six sham trials, three of them Roman trials, three of them religious trials. None of them were legal because you couldn't have trials at night. He had been beaten. He had been scourged. He had had a crown of thorns plunged on his head. They had spat on him. They had made fun of him. And we start the story where Jesus is carrying the cross up the hill to Golgotha. And this is the place where Jesus was going to be crucified and others were going to be crucified. And it was just outside the city wall. And it's called the place of the skull or Golgotha. It's called the skull because the hill looks like a skull. Luke 23. Let's read it. It says this. Great crowds trailed along behind him. Now that's behind Jesus as he's carrying the cross, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. Finally, they came to a place called the Skull, or Golgotha. All three were crucified there, Jesus on the center cross and the two criminals on either side. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. As the crowd stood watching, the leaders laughed and scoffed at Jesus. You know, they just made fun of Christ as he was hanging on the cross. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he really is God's chosen one, the Messiah. The soldiers mocked him too and offered him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. See, Jesus had no intention of saving himself because that's not what he came to do. He was on the cross to save you and me. But the very first word of Jesus on the cross is the word of forgiveness. It's a word that you need to fully understand because when you fully understand the meaning of Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, then you can live the rest of your life guilt-free. What we're going to do this morning is we're going to do three things in this message. First, I want us to look at the ways we usually deal with guilt. And there are three of them. And they are very self-destructive. They are self-defeating. They don't work, but we use them all of the time. Three ways we usually deal with guilt. Then we're going to look at how Jesus wants to deal with guilt so that we can be guilt-free, so that we can have a clear conscience. And then we're going to look at what Jesus does with the guilt because of what he did on the cross. The problem is most people walk around not understanding that. They don't realize what Jesus did. They walk around with a load of unnecessary guilt. So what do we normally do with our guilt? We do three things. First of all, follow me on your outline. First of all, we try to bury it. That's the first thing we do. We bury it. We try to bury our past. That doesn't work very well, does it? You probably heard the advice people say, well, you've just got to bury your past. Forget about it. The problem with that is it just doesn't work because if you notice, it just keeps resurrecting itself. 
It keeps coming back to life. It won't stay buried. It just keeps coming back to remind you at the most inappropriate and the most inconvenient times. And either you will remember it or somebody else will remember it and point it out to you. And it just keeps coming back to haunt you. David says it like this in Psalm 32, verse 3 to 5. He said, when I refused to confess my sins, I was weak and miserable. In other words, the emotional toll on his body was great because he was carrying this load of guilt. And I groaned all day long. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. And all my guilt is gone. When we finally come to God and say, God, I need you to forgive me, he wipes out all of our guilt. And it's such a relief. We go, what was I thinking? Why was I holding on to this in the first place? It's not like God didn't already know the sins that I had done. It's not like he'd all d- he didn't know what I was going to say to him. See, one of the phrases God will never say to you when you confess your sins to him is, oh, really? Oh, I never knew that. I didn't see that one coming. Because he already knew everything you were going to do wrong before he even created you. And he still made you, and he still chose to love you. So it's not like you're going to surprise God by what you do. And when you confess to God, it's not for his benefit, it is for your benefit, to get it off your chest, to get it out of your mind, because you can't bury it. Now, we all have our own favourite ways of burying our guilt. Some of us are minimisers. So what we do is we go around and we say, but well, you know, no big deal really, was it? It wasn't that important. It happened long ago. It's no big deal. Then why do you still remember it? It was a big deal. That's why it keeps coming back in your mind. You can get it out of your, you can't get it out of your mind. It, it, It is a big deal. So minimizing doesn't work. Other of us, we don't minimise, but we rationalise. We say something like this. We say, well, you know, everybody else is doing it. But just because somebody else did it, it doesn't make it right, does it? Rationalising does not remove your guilt. What others do is irrelevant. Some of us are not rationalisers or minimizers. We are compromisers. That's what we do. And the compromise is this. We say things like, I feel really bad about it, so I'll just keep doing it. That's absolutely ridiculous. And there is a word for that. It's called harden your conscience. It's called hardening your heart. Certainly the first time I violate my conscience, I do something wrong and my conscience says, whoa, that was wrong. That was the wrong thing to do. Of course, I'm going to feel bad about it. But if I keep doing it, it pretty soon I begin to think that that is normal. And just because you think it's normal doesn't mean it's right. You've just gotten used to it. So minimising and compromising and rationalising, that doesn't work. You cannot bury it. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says this, You'll never succeed in life if you try to hide your sins. Why is that true? Because you can't really hide them. And it takes enormous amounts of energy to bury your past. It just keeps coming back. The second thing we try to do with our guilt, which doesn't work, is we blame it. We blame it. We bury and we blame. We blame others. Now this tactic is as old as Adam and Eve, the very first couple. When Adam sinned, he took it like a man and he blamed his wife. And husbands have been blaming their wives ever since, and wives have been blaming their husbands ever since, and on and on and on. Parents blaming kids, and kids blaming parents, and so on and so forth. Genesis 3, God comes down and he says, did you do what I told you not to do, i.e. eat of the fruit? And Adam says, yes, Adam admitted, but it was the woman you gave me who brought me some, and I ate it. Who's he blaming here, really? He's blaming God. The woman you gave me. God, when it was just you and me in paradise, it was really great, but then you brought me this little temptress. Ever since then, it's been downhill. God, if you hadn't given me this woman, I would be a godly man. Sound familiar? Question. Who are you blaming for your unhappiness? 
Who are you blaming for your problems? If I just had, had different parents, if I just had a different boss, if my husband would just get his spiritual acts together, if my wife would stop doing this or that, if my kids, my brother, my sister, my boyfriend, who are you blaming for your problems? Who are you blaming for your sins? Who are you, who are you blaming for your guilt? The fact is we are all really good at this. Uh, we're good at accusing and excusing. We accuse everybody else and we excuse ourselves. And we do this all the time. The reason why we blame other people is because we ourselves feel guilty. The more guilty we feel, the more we blame other people. It's a sure sign of guilt. Blame is always an indication that I don't like me. Why? Because in my mind there is a scale between blame and guilt. And we can't handle guilt. So when we feel too guilty, we start blaming other people just to even up the score in our own minds. Clive, do you need to switch that off properly? Or could I encourage someone to perhaps take it away from you so we can lose it, maybe? Because I think you're having a bit of a bubble with it. Maybe it's gone wrong, Clive, perhaps. I don't know. Perhaps Pete will uh, have a look at it for you, maybe. He's just coming around to take it. we don't want to blame anybody else. <laughs> but we do that, don't we? We're always, at times, we, 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 we can't handle those feelings of guilt. So what we tend to do is that we blame other people and we try and even the score with people. We say things like this, well, well you did this. Yeah, but you did that. Yeah, but you did this. Yeah, but you did that. Well, I only did that because you did this. And we go on and on and blaming each other. And blame is always an indication of guilt in relationships. We're trying to justify it in our mind because we can't handle the scale tipped in the wrong direction against us. Sometimes we even try to blame God for our mess like Adam did. Proverbs 19 verse 3 says, Some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then blame the Lord. God, someone says, God, why did you allow me to get into debt? And God says, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. I didn't put all that stuff on your credit card. I didn't tell you to buy all that stuff you don't need. You did that. Why are you blaming me? You made those decisions and you got into debt and now you're blaming, C, blaming me to say, well, why did you let me go into debt? I didn't get you into that situation, God says. And some people ruin themselves by their own stupid decisions and then they blame God. We bury it, we blame others, and neither of those work. Thirdly, the third way we try to deal with guilt that doesn't work is we beat ourselves up. We beat ourselves up. Some of us are blamers, some of us are barriers, but some of us are really good at beating ourselves up. Some of us are merry martyrs. That's what we are. You feel like you have to self-administer punishment to yourself and you're subconsciously trying to atone for the guilt in your life. And so what you do is you make yourself feel really bad because of the guilt. And guilt becomes this heavy load, this burden. David said in Psalm 38, verses 4 to 6, he says, My guilt has overwhelmed me like a load. It weighs me down because I was foolish. I am bent over and bowed down. I am sad all day long. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem with punishing yourself for your own guilt. Your conscience doesn't know when to quit. When you start punishing yourself, your conscience doesn't know when to stop when you've had enough. So it keeps punishing you and punishing you and punishing you. More and more happens. And some of you are beating yourself up over stuff that happened maybe months ago, maybe years ago, maybe even decades ago. Every time you think about it, you just beat yourself up again. Why did I do that? The regret and the shame of all that piles in on you. Now these things, these three ways that so many of us use, if not all of us use, including myself, they don't work. Burying and blaming and beating ourselves up, they do not work. What does Jesus want us to do with our guilt? Because he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. What does he want us to do with our guilt? Well, there are three things. First of all, step number one, admit it. Step one, admit it. That's the starting point. I don't bury it. I don't deny it. I don't ignore it. I just own up to it and I admit I have sinned. I have made a mistake. This was wrong. Sometimes we even try to run from our guilt. We try to run away from it and try to escape from it. And the primary way we do that is by keeping ourselves busy. Busyness is often the coping device for dealing with guilt. 
I'll just keep myself busy. I'll move on to the next thing. But when you're running from guilt, it is going to catch up with you. When you finally slow down and you put your head down on the pillow at night, all those feelings come crashing back in again, don't they? God doesn't want you to live that way. The Bible says you can't run from yourselves. Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The Lord gave us a mind and a conscience we cannot hide from ourselves. You may be able to hide your guilt from everybody else, but you can't hide it from you. That's why I think it starts with personal honesty. Admitting to myself and admitting to God, I I was wrong, Lord. 1 John 1, verse 8 says this, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, we have, as human beings, this amazing ability to lie to ourselves. We lie to ourselves all the time and we believe our lies. We say it's not bad when it really is bad and it's getting better when it isn't getting better and it's okay when it's not okay. We lie to ourselves all the time. Instead, I have to tell myself the truth about myself. I admit it. Step two, after I admit it, I accept responsibility for the rubbish in my life. It's really interesting, David in the uh, Old Testament, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. When he wrote Psalm 51, it's actually his prayer of repentance. David says this, it's really interesting, because as he writes about this, as he writes in his prayer of repentance in Psalm 51, he doesn't mention Bathsheba at all. He doesn't even mention her name. Why? Because it's not about her, it's about him. Psalm 51, verse 3, David says this, I recognise my thoughts, I am conscious of my sins. What's the best way to ensure that I really am acting responsible, that I'm owning up to it? How do I prove that I'm being responsible in this? And I'm going to tell you, but you're not going to like what I'm going to say now. This, This is difficult. This may shock you. The best way to get over the feeling of feeling guilty is to tell one other person. Now, I don't say tell the whole world. We won't put it up on a PowerPoint on the screen about who's done something naughty this week. Just find one person who loves you unconditionally, who is not going to judge you, just who will be a listening ear, and you tell one other person. And that is going to be the removal of your feeling of guilt. Now listen very closely so you don't misunderstand me here. You don't have to confess to another person to be forgiven. All you have to do is confess to God and you will be forgiven. But many of you, God's already forgiven you and you still feel guilty. If you want to be forgiven, you tell God. If you want to feel forgiven you've got to tell one other person. Because that's the way God has wired us. We get well, we get better in community. That's what the church, that's what the family of God is, community. You don't have to tell a bunch of people, you only need to tell one person. And if it's between you and another person that you have sinned against, then you go tell that person first. James 5.16 says this, admit your faults to one another. Circle the word one another. And pray for each other that you may be healed. Circle the word healed. Notice it doesn't say that you may be forgiven, but so that you may be healed. Two different things. Forgiveness comes from God. Healing comes in relationships. This is why so many people have confessed a sin to God and God's forgiven them, but they still carry this guilt for the rest of their lives because they've never been healed. They've been forgiven but not healed of their faults. You say, Phil, why why do I need to do this? Listen very closely. This is the most important thing I'll tell you in this message. The root of all of our problems are relational. Relationships to our parents, to the family that we grew up in, to our friends, to our husband, to our wife, our children, other people in our life, they are all relational. The truth is we are dishonest with each other. We play games with each other. We wear masks all of the time. We fake it. We pretend to have it all together when everybody knows that we don't have it all together. 
but we still go around acting as if we're in a masquerade ball, pretending we've got it all together, that we're okay, that we've not got stuff in our lives. But we're all broken. There are only two kinds of people in the world. People who are broken and sinful and know it, and people who are broken and sinful who won't admit it. That's it. Everything on earth is broken. We're on an imperfect planet. No relationships, no marriage, no family, no job. Nobody is perfect. They are all broken. Sin has affected everything. And when we refuse to be real with another person, it creates all kinds of fears in our lives. It isolates us from each other. It causes fear. It's a roadblock of of intimacy. A roadblock of intimacy in a marriage, for example, or in a friendship. It creates insecurity. If they really knew me, they would not like me. But God wired the world. He made us that we need each other, that we only get well, we get healed in community. And the more you hide it, the more you will hurt. Everybody needs at least one person in their life that they can be totally honest with. Now, I realize that's a challenge for some of us. That means it makes us vulnerable. I would say if you're married, then that person should be your husband or wife, actually. But if you're not married, or actually if you feel that that's perhaps not where you're at, you need one person to say, I've got to tell you this stuff. This is where I'm at. This is what's happening. It's painful. It's hard. But it will deal with those feelings of guilt. Step three, I ask for forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness. One of the great promises in the Bible is 1 John 1 verse 9. Over and over again, God promises to forgive us our sins. He says, if we freely admit that we have sinned, we find God utterly reliable. He forgives our sins and makes us thoroughly clean from all that is evil. See that? He says, I'm going to wipe it out. I'm not going to rub it in. I'm going to rub it out. Makes you clean from all sin. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to ask for forgiveness. Let me, let me tell you the wrong way. Now, I haven't put these on your outline, so why don't you write these down? These would be good for you to write these down. Here's the wrong way to ask for forgiveness. Number one, don't beg. Don't beg. You don't beg God to forgive you. You know, God, please, oh, please, 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 Lord, you know, as if you've got to convince God to forgive you. Please, with sugar on, please, God, No. God wants to forgive you more than you want to ask for it. You're not waiting on God. He's waiting on you. You're the one who is carrying the burden, not him. You're the one who's carrying the guilt, not him. He is waiting on you to go to him. Don't beg. Don't don't bargain. Don't beg with God. Because the second thing is, don't bargain. So you don't beg. Secondly, you don't bargain. Bargaining is, God, if you'll forgive me, I will never, ever do this again. That's bargaining. Don't bargain with God and say, I'll never do it again, because guess what? You will. So don't beg, don't bargain. Thirdly, don't bribe. Don't try to bribe God. Bribing is when you say, God, you're just, if you'll just forgive me this, I will, and then you add in something. I will go to church every week. I will read my Bible every day. I will tithe 15, no, 20% of my income. Don't bribe. You don't bribe God. You can't bargain and there's no need to beg God. So what do you do? Write this one down in capital letters. You just believe. You believe. That's what you do. You believe the many promises of God, where God has promised over and over if you confess your sins, he will forgive your sins. One of the great verses of promise is Romans 3, 24, which interestingly comes right after Romans 3, 23, obviously, but Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and I love the Living Bible, it puts it like this, yet God declares us not guilty if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his mercy freely takes away our sin. Circle those words, if we trust. God declares us not guilty if we trust. It's not begging, bargaining or bribing. It is believing. It is trust in Jesus Christ, who in his mercy freely takes away our sin. That's what Jesus did on the cross. 
Now, I know some of you perhaps are thinking, saying, well, Phil, you don't know what I've done. And you're right, maybe I don't know what you've done. I, in fact, I don't need to know what you've done. Because I want to tell you this, it doesn't matter what you've done. Your forgiveness is not based on how little or how much you've sinned. It doesn't matter what you've done. What matters is what Jesus has done for you. That's what the cross is all about. That's the central truth of Christianity. It's not what I've done or how bad I've, or how bad I've done it. It's what Jesus on the, did on the cross and has already done for me. On the cross, he said, it is finished. It is done. I have paid for all your punishments. No matter what you have done, you can be forgiven today, Jesus says. Now, I know some of you are thinking, Phil, there's, a, you know, there's an incident in my life, in my past, that I am ashamed of, and I've asked God over and over and over and over to forgive me for that incident, but I still don't feel forgiven. Listen very carefully. You do not need to ask God over and over and over again. You only have to ask God one time. God heard you the first time, and if you meant it, he forgave you the first time. You are asking over that thing again and again and again because you don't feel forgiven. But he forgave you the first time. In fact, if you keep asking God to forgive you over and over, it means that you lack faith. You don't really believe that he kept his promise because you don't feel forgiven. You think he hasn't forgiven you? He has. You've been forgiven, but you haven't healed that emotion. Every time you ask God to forgive you for something he's already forgiven, do you know that's a sin? Because you're saying, I don't really believe that you keep your promises to forgive me in the moment that I ask. It's a lack of faith. What it means is that you don't understand how God forgives. So the most important part of the message is this. What Jesus does with my guilt because of the cross. Based on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. You need to understand the ways that he forgives you. First of all, he forgives instantly. He forgives instantly. He doesn't say you have to suffer a little while. We like to do that, but God doesn't do that. He never makes us wait. He doesn't say, well, do you know what? I'll need to think about that before I make my mind up. Um, He forgives the moment you ask him. There is zero delay. The split second you ask God for forgiveness, you are forgiven in that moment. He doesn't draw it out or drag it out. In Isaiah 55 verse 7, it says that God is merciful and quick to forgive. Circle the word quick. Isn't that a wonderful verse? God is merciful and quick to forgive. He forgives instantly. Secondly, he forgives completely. He forgives instantly. He forgives completely. When Jesus died for your sins on the cross, which sins did he die for? Ever thought about that? Shall I tell you? All of them. All of them. That means even the ones that I'm going to commit this afternoon and the ones that I'm going to do next month and next year and in 10 years' time, They've already been paid for by Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verses 13 to 14 says this. He, Jesus, has forgiven all your sins. He has utterly wiped out the evidence. Isn't that good? Wiped out the evidence of broken commandments which always hung over our heads and has completely annulled it, all your sins, by nailing it to the cross. Circle those words, wiped out. He wiped it out. All the evidence... Listen, that means when you get to heaven and you say, God, you know, um, about that sin in 2014, he'll go, what sin? There's no evidence of that sin. It's wiped out. He wipes out everything you've ever done so there is no evidence of it for eternity. That's good news. That means he's forgotten it. And if God has forgotten it, don't you think you should forget it too? Are you better than God? Don't you think you ought to let it go? You see, God doesn't just forgive, he forgets. He intentionally forgets. It says, and he has completely annulled it by nailing it to the cross. Annulled means as if it never happened. All the stuff I've done wrong never happened. No evidence God has forgiven you. That, you see, is why the cross is so important. 
And if you don't understand that God forgives instantly and completely, here's what's going to happen. The next time something starts to go wrong in your life, you're going to start thinking, well, do you know what? God is getting even with me now. He remembers what I did, that really bad thing I did two years ago. Now God's settling the score, and and God is punishing me now for, for what I did back then. Listen very closely. If you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, if you've been saved, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've made him number one in your life, God never punishes his children. Never, never, never. Why? Because all of the punishment was taken by Jesus Christ on the cross. He took all the punishment for your sin. And if Jesus took all the punishment for my sin, then God turns around, then if God turns around and punishes me, it's like saying that what Jesus did on the cross was a complete waste. There's no value to it. If God is going to punish me, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? God says, all the punishment for all your sins, Jesus took upon himself. So when you sin and you've trusted Christ, he does not punish you, never. Now, does he correct you? Of course he does. Does he discipline you? Yes, he does. Does he bring things into our lives that perhaps challenge us and are difficult and hard? Yes, because he's a loving father that wants to discipline us and correct us and to bring us back on track with him. But he never punishes us for our sins. Because punishment is looking backwards. But correction and discipline are looking forward. God forgives completely because Jesus has already paid for all your sins on the cross. And this is thirdly, this is most important of all, he forgives freely. He forgives freely. In other words, you cannot earn it, you can't deserve it, you can't buy it, you can't bargain for it. It is a gift of grace. Because you are a human being, forgiveness is your greatest need. And because Christ died for you, forgiveness is God's greatest gift. So let's get real practical. What's the secret sin in your life that keeps on hounding you? Even as I ask you that, it's flooded into your minds. It's there, you feel uncomfortable. Or what is that habitual sin that keeps on hounding you? You can be guilt-free today. Here's what the Bible says in Ephesians 1 verse 7. For by the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross, we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God? Friends, this is the fundamental truth of Christianity, that God took your problem and he made it his problem and said, I'm going to wipe it all out. I'm going to wipe out all of your sins by paying for it himself. So justice is served, grace is given. The cross is the foundation of everything God does for you and in your life. And you need to accept that right now. So all of us, I want all of us today to settle this issue once and for all. Number one, I know all my sins are forgiven. And two, I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die. They're the issues we have to face. And I want you to settle that. So what I'm going to do, we're going to pray, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you may be coming to CEC for 10 years, or this might be your first time. I want you to receive God's forgiveness and salvation today. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer so that you can step across the line, that you can make Jesus your Savior and your Lord. And I'm going to pray for you first. Let's bow our heads. And I'm going to pray for you first of all. I'm going to lead you then in a prayer. Let me pray for us all first of all. Father, I know that without a doubt there are people right here listening that are suffering under an immense load of guilt and shame and regret. For some it's been eaten away at them for years. Let this be the day of their release, the day of relief, their day of redemption, their day of salvation. Let this day be their day of freedom. The freedom that comes from being totally forgiven. Now I encourage you to pray. Take the steps to forgiveness and salvation. I mean, it doesn't really matter what you say, but I'm going to say something. You can echo this in your heart. Pray this too. Maybe just as I say each sentence, you just say, me too, God. Me too. Dear God, you know everything about me. You already know all the things I'm ashamed of. You know all my regrets, all my sins, all my mistakes. 
You know the habitual actions and habits and attitudes that I feel guilty about. This is no surprise to you, Lord. Today, I humbly admit that I need your forgiveness. I agree with you that what I've done wrong is wrong, and I have sinned. A lot of times I've done what I've wanted to do rather than the right thing. Today, I want to accept responsibility for my sins. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm not going to make any excuses. I'm going to own up to what's wrong in my life. I want to change. I want to go your way. I want to make a U-turn. I want to repent. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross. I ask you to take away my sin and my guilt. I don't know how it all works, but thank you for paying for my sins on the cross so I can be forgiven. Today, in faith, I accept your gift of forgiveness and salvation. I'm stepping across the line. Save me. Thank you for forgiving me instantly and completely and freely. Please help me to feel forgiven and help me to forgive myself and help me to offer forgiveness to other people. In your name I pray. Amen. See, now if you prayed that prayer, then the Bible says, on the authority of God's word, it says that you are forgiven. That if you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life, you are forgiven. That's not me just an opinion. That is based on the word of God. Let me show you Psalm 32 verses 1 to 2 says, What happens for those whose guilt has been forgiven? What relief for those who God has cleared their record? If you're a Christian, hold that verse in your heart this week. If you're not a Christian, that can be true for you, that God can clear your record, your sinful past. Your guilt can be taken care of. You can be forgiven. And if you are a Christian, live in that hope. Don't just know you're forgiven, but feel that you are forgiven. And live with that wonderful truth. And we're going to sing a song that speaks about how the power of the cross changes everything, how it transforms us. And this is a great song that takes us from the cross but reminds us of the hope as well that what Christ has done.